Tuck Everlasting, Chapter 1 The road that led to Tree Gap had been trod out long before by a herd of cows who were, to say the least, relaxed. It wandered along in curves and easy angles, swayed off and up in a pleasant tangent to the top of a small hill, ambled down again between fringes of bee-hung clover, and then cut sideways across a meadow. Here, its edges blurred. It widened and seemed to pause, suggesting tranquil bovine picnics, slow chewing and thoughtful contemplation of the infinite. And then it went on again and came at last to the wood. But on reaching the shadows of the first trees, it veered sharply, swung out in a wide arc as if for the first time it had reason to think where it was going, and passed around. On the other side of the wood, the sense of easiness dissolved. The road no longer belonged to the cows. It became instead, and rather abruptly, the property of people. And all at once, the sun was uncomfortably hot the dust oppressive, and the meager grass along its edges somewhat ragged and forlorn. On the left stood the first house, a square and st solid cottage with a touch-me-not appearance, surrounded by grass cut painfully to the quick and enclosed by a capable iron fence some four feet high, which clearly said, Move on. We don't want you here. So the road went humbly by and made its way, past cottages more and more frequent but less and less forbidding, into the village. But the village doesn't matter, except for the jailhouse and the gallows. The first house only is important. The first house, the road, and the wood. There was something strange about the wood. If the look of the first house suggested that you'd better pass it by, so did the look of the wood, but for quite a different reason. The house was so proud of itself that you wanted to make a lot of noise as you passed, and maybe even throw a rock or two. But the wood had a sleeping, otherworld appearance that made you want to speak in whispers. This, at least, is what the cows must have thought. Let it keep its peace. We won't disturb it. Whether the people felt that way about the wood or not is difficult to say. There were some, perhaps, who did but for the most part, the people followed the road around the wood because that was the way it led. There was no road through the wood. And anyway, for the people, there was another reason to leave the wood to itself. It belonged to the Fosters, the owners of the touch-me-not cottage, and was therefore private property in spite of the fact that it lay outside the fence and was perfectly accessible. The ownership of land is an odd thing when you come to think of it. How deep, after all, can it go? If a person owns a piece of land, then does he own it all the way down in ever-narrowing dimensions till it meets all other pieces at the center of the earth? Or does ownership consist only of a thin crust under which the friendly worms have never heard of trespassing? In any case, the wood being on top, except of course for its roots, was owned bud and bough by the fosters in the touch-me-not cottage, and if they never went there, if they never wandered in among the trees, well, that was their affair. Winnie, the only child of the house, never went there, though she sometimes stood inside the fence, carelessly banging a stick against the iron bar bars and looked at it. But she had never been curious about it. Nothing ever seems interesting when it belongs to you, only when it doesn't. And what is interesting, anyway, about a few slim acres of trees... There will be a dimness shot through with bars of sunlight, a great many squirrels and birds, a deep, damp mat mattress of leaves on the ground, and all the other things just as familiar, if not so pleasant, like the spiders, thorns, and grubs. In the end, however, it was the cows who were responsible for the wood's isolation, and the cows, through some wisdom they were not wise enough to know that they possessed, were very wise indeed. If they had made their road through the wood, instead of around it, then the people would have followed the road. The people would have noticed the giant ash tree at the center of the wood. And then, in time, they'd have noticed the little spring bubbling up among its roots, in spite of the pebbles piled there to conceal it. And that would have been a disaster so immense that this weary old earth, owned or not to its fiery core, 
would have trembled on its axis like a beetle on a pen.